Well, good morning, everyone. I think I'll make a start. Uh, it's wonderful so many of you have been able to join us for our AGM. It's a while since we've had one. Um, I'm Sue Cherry. I'm uh, the chairman of Crohn's and Colitis UK and have been since 2016. Um, I'll start by way of introductions and then we'll move into some format and housekeeping before we get into the agenda itself. So introductions. Um, I've introduced myself. Could I ask the trustees who are with us to give us a wave? Here we are, a few of them are with us today. Um, Sarah Sleet, our chief executive. Sarah, Miss Sarah. And could I ask the executive um, team to give us a wave as well? Miss Claire, Andrew, where are you? Missing, in action. <laughs> sure, we'll be with us shortly. Um, and last but not least, Dr. Tariq Ahmed, who is our keynote speaker today. A big and a warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, format and housekeeping. Um, first order of the day is Dr. Ahmed, who's going to talk to us um, about the effect of biologic drugs on COVID-19 and vaccines. Um, he's been leading research into this, and it's very exciting for us all to hear. Thank you. Um, the AGM itself, um, we're going to give you an overview of 2020. And my word, what a year that was. We're going to, Sarah's then going to talk about our future plans. In the middle of it all, we have a very kind of boring, some may say, um, item, but we need to align our registered name at Companies House with um, our, our brand name that we use. Um, so we've had you voting on that and there'll be an opportunity for those of you who haven't voted to vote the meeting. We would very much like to hear from you all during the course of the event and you can do that in two ways. You can use the chat function um, but that's very much if you want to make comments. If you have questions um, you use the Q&A function. Time is obviously um, not limitless today and we'll do the best to answer the questions that are mo of most interest to people and the way you can show that is by using the thumbs up function under any questions that appear. We have a, a team of people who are looking at the questions who will prioritise them. Anything we don't get to today um, I, I would um, direct you to our website where already we have a huge amount of information about COVID and about everything else to do with Crohn's and Colitis UK. And um, we will do our best to answer questions on there. Today's meeting is being recorded um, and the transcript um, available to anybody who doesn't have internet access. So over to our first um, item, which is a warm welcome to Dr. Tariq Ahmed, who is consultant gastroenterologist at the Royal Devon and Exeter NHS Foundation Trust and honorary associate professor of gastroenterology at the University of Exeter. Tariq is leading the research team looking at the impact of two biologic medicines on COVID-19 infections, vaccinations, and immune response in people with Crohn's and colitis. Thank, thanks to the drive of Tariq and many others working um, on the project, um, Gastroenterology Services, it's ensured that this important research is really has been put as part of um, a COVID-19 urgent response study programme. Um, this enormous effort has brought results very quickly and these have influenced public health decisions. Uh, the speed of it's unprecedented. And the charity has been delighted to support use it results to influence government uh, in meetings and with the vaccine minute, minister and NHS leaders. Together, we are working to make sure we make sure that your needs are heard at this very strange time. Dr. Ahmed, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and uh, welcome to everybody who's uh, dialed in today. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so just bear with me for a minute while I do that. So I hope you can all now see uh, my screen. So um, I, I, as um, 
uh, yeah, I've already been introduced as a gastroenterologist. I'm, most of my time I'm, um, I'm working with patients uh, in Devon, um, but um, half of my time probably at the moment is spent uh, running this study, Clarity IBD. And this is the acronym for a rather longer, more difficult to digest title of Impact of Biologics and Immunomodulatory Therapy on SARS-CoV-2 Infection and Immunity in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And as has been already said, this is one of 95 urgent public health studies that's been running over the last 18 months. And urgent public health means that um, our study along with the others have been prioritized for resource. Um, all of these studies are focused on uh, COVID-19, whereas much of the other research uh, in the UK has stopped over this period of time. It's only just recently restarted. So wind back 18 months to March 2020. This was, of course, a very difficult time for all of us, but particularly for uh, people and their families living with inflammatory bowel disease, um, where house arrest um, really meant house arrest for many months, particularly for those uh, people with inflammatory bowel disease and other immune-mediated diseases. And it wasn't the disease itself that put people at risk, but the fear was it was the treatment itself uh, that was putting people potentially at harm from COVID-19. So back in March uh, 2020, the British Society of Gastroenterology uh, tried to help stratify people um, uh, as to their risk of COVID-19 according to the drugs that they were taking. And so people were designated into these three different groups, high risk, who were told to go away and shield, moderate risk, who were told to, to follow stringent social distancing measures, and the lowest risk people who were felt to be at the same risk as the general population. But the, at the time, there was very little data to justify these groups. And so it was based really on limited information and expert opinion. And to allow um, patients to understand which group they fell into, um, the IBD Registry, BSG and Crohn's and Colitis UK got together to come up and develop this uh, risk tool. So using that risk grid that I just showed you and putting it into a format that could be easily uh, digested. And this was led by uh, Nick Kennedy, one of my friends and colleagues uh, in Exeter. And uh, when I last looked at this, more than 35,000 people with inflammatory bowel disease across the UK had used this tool to find out which group they fell into. So it was about this time back in uh, March, April 2020 that we felt that we needed to try and fill in some of the data holes um, because there really wasn't much information to, uh, to guide us. So we're talking now about a period before vaccination was available. And so the key questions that we wanted to ask were, do the drugs that we use in IBD, do they impact the risk of getting the virus, the risk of having a severe COVID-19 illness, and also um, particularly in this project, looking at antibody response following infection. Do the drugs impair the normal protective antibody response that follows uh, infection? So we put together a team of, a crack team of people, um, Nick Powell from Imperial, uh, Nick uh, from Exeter, Claire, who's been my project manager, running many projects um, across the UK over the last 10 years. James Goodhand here, who uh, is rather shy, doesn't um, like to, to show his face much, but he does a lot of the work behind these studies. Uh, Rachel Nice, who runs our laboratory, and Seb Sharji, Professor of Gastroenterology in Hull. This study uh, rolled out, as you'll see, uh, in 92 hospitals across the UK, uh, involved 92 consultant gastroenterologists and more than 400 uh, research and IBD nurses. And the study, um, the costs of the study were met by various pharmaceutical companies who, at the beginning of the pandemic, were very uh, prepared to help support uh, this effort. And of course, by the National Institute for Health Research, who provided the costs for all the nurses. So we designed initially a 40 week study. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to follow people, consecutive people treated with infliximab or vedolizumab at 92 UK sites 
And these are shown on the map on the left-hand side. We chose these two drugs because in Fliximab, over the last 20 years, research has shown that this drug increases uh, the risk of uh, infection, particularly respiratory infections, and also impairs the normal protective response to certain vaccines. Um, it's a relatively mild effect, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it, it has been widely shown. In contrast, bedalizumab, a much newer agent, uh, has not been shown to be associated with serious infection or to impair vaccine response. So effectively, the people treating, being treated on bedalizumab were our control group in this study. We recruited just under 7,000 patients in a 12-week period running up to Christmas last year. And this was record recruitment, for, certainly for any IBD study, I should think anywhere in the world. One of the key differences about this study was we sought permission to hold participants' personal data. And that meant that was unusual because normally a central site doesn't have that access to that information, but it was important. It allowed us to contact participants directly with questionnaires and consent forms. And uh, it allowed us to link our data with the nationally held PCR testing and vaccine data. So that was crucial to have people's personal data. It's kept very safely under very strict conditions, but it did enable us to deliver this project um, efficiently. So this is the rough design of the study. Essentially, the patients did the work uh, and that was completing a questionnaire every eight weeks. And I know that many of the participants have got rather fed up with the questionnaires, um, but we, we have tried to improve them and shorten them a bit as time goes on. But every eight weeks when participants attended for an infusion, um, the, a blood sample was taken and sent to Exeter. The questionnaires detailed information about uh, symptoms, hospitalizations related to COVID, as well as information regarding disease activity and levels of anxiety and depression uh, amongst people living with IBD. These samples were sent to uh, our uh, laboratory in Exeter. Now this laboratory is situated in the main NHS biochemistry department and every day hundreds of parcels containing blood samples would arrive for us to unpackage and process. And the advantage of running it in our NHS laboratory rather than in a research lab was that the samples were subject to the same stringent uh, quality control measures that NHS blood samples are. Blood samples were tested for antibodies to COVID. And we used two tests. The first test we used was one against the N protein or nuclear capsid. And this told us whether people had had evidence of past infection. Following vaccination, we introduced another test against the spike protein of the virus. And this told us whether people had had either a past vaccination or a past infection. And we used the combination of these tests to look for uh, infections in people who'd been vaccinated, i.e. breakthrough infections. And what was different about this study is we have returned the results to patients directly. So people would send a text message to participants to say, your result is ready, please log in and you can have your antibody test result. During the pandemic, understandably, people were reluctant to come to hospital um, to have their infusions. Um, uh, and a number of hospitals switch patients from intravenous to subcutaneous preparations of infliximab and vedalizumab. These, these preparations both became available during the pandemic. In order to keep these patients in, we realized that we needed to have some form of home blood monitoring uh, system available. So we developed finger prick testing um, it's not perfect, um, it, it, it does require some dexterity, but it has enabled us uh, for some patients who have been uh, shielding at home to uh, carry out blood tests, put them in the post, and, and then we can process the antibody levels on that sample. And in fact, we've now extended this service uh, to, for, for standard blood test monitoring and drug level monitoring uh, for our patients who live far from Exeter. So here are the inclusion criteria. We studied adults and children aged five years and over, and they had to be treated with either intravenous or subcutaneous infliximab or vedalizumab for at least six weeks. 
we excluded people who were taking part in the vaccine trial. And there weren't many people uh, who were actually allowed in because the drugs themselves pre prevented, most of the trials prevented these, these people coming in. So the first question that we asked is, um, have patients uh, treated with vedalizumab and fliximab had similar COVID experiences? And to answer this question, we simply looked at the, the data from the very first study visit, so study visit one on recruitment. And what we saw was that there were no differences in the social distancing behavior adopted by patients treated with either drug. And there was no difference uh, in exposure to COVID-19 cases. Overall, there was no difference between PCR infection, confirmed infection, in people treated with either drug, 5.2% versus 4.3%. And because vedalizumab patients were assumed to have no increased risk compared to the background population, this suggests that probably infliximab patients also have no additional risk. At the beginning of the pandemic, testing wasn't widely available, as you will remember. And so we also asked about suspected COVID-19 based on their symptoms. And again, there was no difference. And in terms of hospitalizations, reassuringly, the hospitalization rate, certainly at the end of 2020, was very low, 0.2% uh, of participants and no difference between the two groups. So that was really very reassuring. And we've updated this now, um, uh, uh, several months on, nine months on. This graph here is a bit difficult to, 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 to uh, understand, but essentially it looks at the time to a positive PCR infection. And everybody, this, this includes everybody up until the time of their first vaccination. And what we see is that prior to vaccination, there's no difference uh, in the time to infections. The numbers of infections are no different uh, prior to vaccination, suggesting that there's an equal risk uh, uh, of COVID-19 infection in both groups which of course is reassuring. However, despite similar rates of suspected and confirmed infections, antibody levels, this is going back to December 2020 again, antibody levels were detected in 6% of vedalizumab patients, but just 3.4% of infliximab patients, suggesting that, that although there's no difference in infection rates, uh, antibody levels are impaired in, pe in people treated with infliximab. So that protective antibody level uh, is, not, is, 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 is seen much less frequently uh, in infliximab treated patients. Now, what did that mean? Well, it meant perhaps that uh, infliximab treated patients may be susceptible to having another infection. But I think more importantly, it hinted that there may be a problem with vaccine responses. So, uh, we then uh, looked in more detail uh, at patients with PCR-confirmed infections, and we saw that in vedalizumab-treated patients, more than 80% had antibodies. That was very reassuring. But in people with infliximab, uh, under half had antibodies after a confirmed infection. And if you're on infliximab and an immunomodulator such as azathioprine, this rate was even lower. So of course, uh, vaccination then arrived in December 2020, and that was very exciting. And certainly in the general population, we had reassuring data that uh, uh, vaccination prevented asymptomatic infection, symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, severe disease, and death. Uh, then later in the summer uh, of, uh, of this year, uh, we learned that the vaccination also reduces person-to-person -person transmission. But of course, all of this information was from the background population or healthy individuals, and it wasn't focusing predominantly or focusing at all on people treated with um, immunosuppressant drugs. So the next part of Clarity addresses uh, the question about vaccination uh, in people uh, treated with inflammatory bowel disease treated with these drugs. So our questions were, do the drugs we use affect antibody response to vaccination? The durability of antibodies, do they decline faster? 
T cell responses, because of course, it's not all about antibody responses, but also T cell responses. And the risk, importantly, the risk of breakthrough infections after vaccination. So the data on this graph show antibody responses or the proportion of people who've reached a certain threshold after one vaccine dose. And what we saw after one vaccine dose is that a large proportion of people treated with infliximab, shown in the, in the blue here, um, uh, in the blue here, are, 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 have very low antibody levels. Uh, and we see this both with the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca. So one vaccine dose um, doesn't appear to elicit significant antibody responses uh, in patients treated with infliximab. So this was a, a bit of a, a concern when this, this, this data first came out, um, and we urged people to continue to get their second vaccine dose. And fortunately, after two, two vaccine doses, the vast majority of people, more than 90% seroconverted or reached a threshold that we believe uh, would offer some protection. Of course, we now know with the Delta virus, and most of, the people, most of this work um, predates, uh, this initial work predates the Delta virus, but we now know that for even healthy people, one dose of vaccine just isn't enough to offer protection against the Delta variant. So although the results, um, um, although after uh, two doses of vaccine, certainly in the short term, antibody responses were good, we then wanted to know what happened over time. Now, this is a complicated diagram, but I'm gonna try and take you through this. On the left-hand side, we've got people vaccinated with Pfizer, and on the right, we've got people vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And people treated with infliximab are in green, and people treated with vedolizumab are in this orange-brown color. And this represents the average antibody concentration for the whole group of people treated with infliximab and a whole group of people treated with uh, vedolizumab. And what we see after the second dose, we see a massive jump up in antibody levels. They're significantly lower in infliximab compared to vedolizumab patients, sixfold lower. But as you can see, over time, um, antibody responses rapidly fall, such that by 24 weeks, uh, half the people treated with infliximab have fallen below this threshold that we think may offer protection. Um, and we see a similar issue with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Over time, levels fall. Now, of course, even in healthy people, we see this, um, but it appears that in infliximab treated patients, they fall uh, much faster. Now, the bottom half of the screen I'm going to show you uh, now is looking at people who had a prior infection before their two doses of vaccine, i.e. they'd had three encounters with the virus, one, the true virus, and two, vaccinations. And what you can see here is that um, after three contacts, um, they have much uh, more sustained antibody levels. So if you've had an infection, this is good news because um, clearly uh, um, you have much more long lasting protection. It also hints that a third dose or a booster dose may achieve similar, more sustained antibody responses. We also looked at other factors. So apart from drugs, are there other factors which um, impact antibody levels? And um, you can see here on this graph, on the left-hand side, factors on the left-hand side of this dotted line are associated cause lower antibody levels. Factors on the right-hand side associated with increased antibody levels. And you can see that infliximab here is the, the further you are away from this dotted line, the bigger the impact of this factor. And you can see that infliximab exerts the strongest effect and having the Pfizer vaccine compared to the AstraZeneca is the biggest sort of positive factor. But there are some other factors here. So being on a thiopurine, being on methotrexate, being on steroids, all lower your antibody levels, but not to the same extent as infliximab. Having Crohn's disease compared to ulcerative colitis, being older, and of course we've known this, from a number of other studies and being a current smoker. Now, I've not seen that in any other work to date, but smoking seems to lower your antibody level. There may be a confounding factor that we've not discovered to explain this, 
but I think it's another reason to stop smoking. If you look at the other half of this uh, uh, graph, you can see that being of non-white ethnicity is associated uh, with higher levels. So one good uh, uh, news story for people of non-white ethnicity, when most of the news story has been pretty uh, negative. So one of the key questions is I've shown you data on antibody levels, but what really matters is whether people are having further infections after vaccination. So in our cohort of 7,000 patients, 5% have had a breakthrough infection despite two doses of vaccine. Um, so these are people who've had a positive PCR test more than two weeks following their second dose of vaccine. We've looked at the risk factors, you know, what, 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 what are the factors that, that, that these people have that others don't? Uh, and again, it's people on infliximab, it's people that have been vaccinated with the, the, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine rather than the Pfizer vaccine. People who are younger are more at risk. Undoubtedly, I think this is explained by the fact that younger people are likely to be less cautious uh, than older people. And also interestingly, those people who've had a lower antibody level after the second dose, suggesting perhaps that knowledge of your antibody level after a second dose might potentially identify which people are at risk. This is still far from being clinically useful, but it's an interesting observation. So that's the bad news, 5% breakthrough infections. But the good news is that um, only two of the people with breakthrough infections in our study um, were hospitalized with COVID-19. The rest were mildly symptomatic, managed, to, uh, managed at home uh, without too many difficulties. So um, although it might look alarming, a 5% breakthrough rate, um, the risk of severe disease is very, very low following vaccination. So um, what about other anti-TNF drugs? Um, of course, we use adalimumab and golimumab as uh, alternatives to infliximab. And what about the use of these drugs in other diseases? Well, we are reasonably confident that this applies to all anti-TNF drugs. This is a class effect. And we have done some work with adalimumab showing pretty similar results. Now, um, what about other drugs? Um, so we've shown that if you're if in, the, in the study so far, that if you're taking azathioprine or mecaptopurine or methotrexate alongside infliximab, that increases your risk of reducing antibody formation even further. We haven't studied here um, using these drugs alone without infliximab, but we're, we're certain that these drugs also will reduce uh, antibody levels, but not to the same extent. We also believe that, uh, and, and we see, and other studies have shown that this applies to other um, diseases. So patients who are taking these medicines for skin or joint problems uh, will also uh, see the same effect. So I wanted just to, at the end here, turn, turn, turn to uh, 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 some information about third vaccine doses, because I'm sure this is of interest to you. So here are the uh, JCVI guidance on who is entitled to a third dose. So this is the official guidance, and I'm going to show you on the next slide what the British Society of Gastroenterology are recommending. So JCVI has said that anybody who has taken a targeted therapy in the three months prior to either vaccine dose are eligible for a third dose. So you'll see here that this includes anti-TNF, and it includes ustekinumab. Vedilizumab isn't specifically mentioned on this list, but they state in this document that this list of drugs is not exhaustive. It also includes people taking prednisolone around the time of their vaccination, and they needed to be taking more than 20 milligrams uh, for more than 10 days in the, in the month prior to either dose, or 10 or more milligrams uh, per day for more than four weeks in the previous three months, or greater than 7.5 milligrams in combination with one of the uh, with another immunosuppressant. Now, immunomodulators, many patients with inflammatory bowel disease are taking these drugs alone. Um, the JCBI suggested that unless you were taking high dose of these drugs, you didn't need a third vaccine dose. Um, however, um, 
This is the current draft British Society of Gastroenterology Guidance. It's not as yet published, but I think it will be published next week. And this is um, much, uh, it's, it's not quite so clearly defined. Um, and I think it will uh, bring in a greater number of patients. And I suspect that most gastroenterology teams around the country will follow the BSG guidance rather than the JCBI, uh, although that will be left to individual units to decide. But you'll see anybody taking any of these drugs um, uh, are eligible, will be offered a third dose. Of course, a third dose needs to be distinguished from a booster dose. Um, a booster dose is going to be offered to everybody 50 years or over um, anyway, but that will probably occur slightly later than the third dose offered to the uh, extremely clinically vulnerable group or those on the drugs that we've just discussed. So many, many, many patients living with IBD will uh, be offered a third dose imminently. And I suspect that many people have already been contacted over the last 24 hours and offered a time to come and have this done. So a bit more about the implementation of a third dose. Um, there's gonna be a preference for uh, the mRNA-based uh, vaccine. So that's the Pfizer dose. And I think our data supports that that would be a better option uh, for people on these medicines. It needs to be given at least eight weeks after the second dose. So if you've only had your second dose four weeks ago, um, it's advisable to wait um, a further four weeks. And this is, the, this is the slightly tricky step, but it should be given um, either in a treatment holiday or when the, the level of the drug is lowest in the blood. So what that means, um, because we've seen this impact of medicines on antibody levels, we want to try and time the dose of vaccination where possible when the drug level is lowest. And for, for infliximab, if you're on an eight weekly cycle of drug, this means being vaccinated between weeks four and week six. So that's gonna require quite a lot of coordination with vaccine centers to get that right. Um, is it essential? No, it's not. I think if, if, if it's, it's better just to get the dose, but if, if you wanted to time this perfectly, uh, that's how you do it. Um, the other point to mention is that if you've been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease relatively recently or started immunosuppressant relatively recently, and if it was more than two weeks after your second dose, you really don't need to worry um, about the third dose. Um, so this is really about people on treatment prior to and running up to a dose of vaccine. And in order to um, capture uh, what happens to participants in, in the Clarity study after a third dose, um, we have decided to extend the Clarity study for a further 24 weeks. Uh, and that started uh, last week. Um, this requires um, participants to be re-consented uh, and to stay in the study. We hope that people will, and they're not too fed up uh, with receiving messages from us. Um, but this will allow us to look exactly what happens for individual participants um, following a third dose. So I wanted to finish um, by giving some specific advice to patients taking anti-TNF therapy, because I didn't want to leave people on this drug feeling alarmed. But the first message is continue anti-TNF therapy. Um, there doesn't appear to be any risk, any additional risk of COVID-19 uh, associated with taking these drugs. So the rates of hospitalizations, the rates of severe COVID-19 are low, particularly if you've had two doses of vaccine. So please continue taking the drug. It is probably one of our best treatments that we have available to us. Patients uh, with inflammatory bowel disease sh should accept whichever vaccine is offered, even if they've previously been infected with the virus. So don't assume that because you've had the virus, you don't need a vaccine. I would definitely still have the vaccine. Importantly, if you're young and you've only relatively recently, if you've only relatively recently got your first dose, um, then assume you're not protected until you've had your second dose. Um, uh, and, and after that, I think you can feel much more confident. I've shown you some information about breakthrough infections, but they are 
still relatively uncommon, and they are nearly always mild. So don't be alarmed uh, by that data. Except the third dose as soon as it's offered. And as I've said, um, if you're on an eight weekly schedule on infliximab, then um, try and get it uh, uh, weeks four to six. If you're taking adalimumab, I would probably try to get it in the second week, but I don't think it's so essential. And finally, if you're one of the 7,000 uh, Clarity participants, please do stay with us in the extension um, and uh, we'll continue to provide you with your antibody data. So thank you very much, Crohn's and Colitis, and thank you to the participants and the, the nursing staff around the country who've done so much to uh, deliver this study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tarek. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. And as you can imagine, the comments and the questions were pouring in as you were speaking. So we've got an opportunity to, to just pose a few questions to you. Just for the audience, as you know, um, we asked people if they wanted to send some questions in beforehand. Um, and we've had questions actually during the talk. We're not going to get to them all, undoubtedly. Um, so I'm just going to pose a few here now, but to reassure everybody, what we will do after the meeting and into next week is go through the questions and um, make sure that we can make them available to you um, as we can. So just starting off, if you're going into a flare, um, should you still take the vaccine at that point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have looked at this, I haven't shown you the data, um, but vaccination doesn't appear to impact uh, disease activity. And as far as we can see, um, disease activity doesn't impact vaccine response. Um, of course, if you're given a course of steroids um, uh, to treat your uh, flare, uh, or if you're started on a new drug, then that, that may impact the, the uh, 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 response to vaccination. Um, if your disease is relatively mild, um, and you can hold off uh, treatment for a week or two, um, then that might be advisable. But I think if you're unsure, you should take advice from your local team. Um, certainly what we're doing for people um, who we know are, need to start, say for instance, infliximab, uh, we've seen them this week, um, they're not too bad, they could probably wait a couple of weeks, we've arranged them to have their third dose this weekend uh, or early next week so that um, uh, they can hold off for a couple of weeks uh, before starting treatment. That's great, thank you. Um, and just, you mentioned about the breakthrough infections and um, a few people wanted to know, how does that compare with the general population? I mean, are there more breakthrough um, infections coming through people who are being treated with the biologics or is it, you know, about the same? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And um, uh, uh, we, I, I can't give you a, 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 an accurate answer to that right at this minute, but we are in the process of um, comparing our data uh, to a healthy population uh, 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 data from another study. We've already done that to look at antibody responses. So we've used data from the virus watch study to show that antibody decay um, uh, uh, on bedalizumab is no different to the healthy population. What we haven't done quite yet is look to see whether the rate to break for infections is, is different from the background population or not. Great. Um, and another one, which has come up time and again, actually, in conversation throughout this period, do you think that people, many people were shielding, choosing to shield and having to shield do you think that's affected the results here because they're less exposed actually to infections, et cetera? Yes, yeah, so um, some of the question that was sent out um, uh, uh, did capture information about shielding behavior um, every eight weeks. And so we've tried to control for that, for that's in the comparison of infliximab versus vedalizumab, but it does make it difficult to compare it with any other data. Um, so yes, it is a major confounding factor, of course. So um, we might get some results around that. We might get some indications going forward, but it's, it's a tricky one, obviously, to, to deal with. Um, 
just thinking about the wider impact and obviously people are a shielding has officially gone people are being um, asked to go back to work more is there anything in the results um, that you can think should you you know you advise people to to look at when they're thinking about returning to work or even education so i think um I, I think patients with inflammatory bowel disease treated with these medicines should adopt the same measures that all of us should. Um, I, I, I think particularly if you look at schools, I, I, I think education, the benefits of education have, be, uh, and, uh, have got to be weighed against the risks of, of uh, keeping children away. Uh, uh, and I, I would encourage people to try and not worry too much uh, about the risks associated with these therapies. The, the, the real impact we've seen is, is regarding antibody responses. I haven't shown you the T-cell data uh, today, but that is reassuring too. Um, so I think um, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that if patients, uh, people with IBD get a third dose, that um, they will be protected. And I, I wouldn't worry unduly uh, about getting back to work and getting back to school. Yeah, so that's an important message really, isn't it? Because, um, you know, the impact of um, having to kind of, moder you know, um, change your lifestyle so hugely just to, on the basis of um, fear is, is really quite... Um, yeah, the original... The yeah. guidance that came out originally from the BSG and from the government obviously was the, a cautious advice, cautious recommendations with the, in the absence of any knowledge uh, and any data. And I think as that's come out, I think people should feel more comfortable. Excellent. And then um, perhaps not necessarily something you can really answer, but um, is definitely a live topic at the moment. People um, who probably are in the or know they're in the third dose group and haven't heard anything. Um, where, should they be hearing something from their consultant? Should they be hearing from the GP? Um, what, what's happening there? Yes, yeah, so it's up to individual hospitals and teams to identify people who um, are eligible for a third dose and to forward that data onto their GPs and to vaccine, vaccine centres. Different hospitals, it's clear from the chat that I'm involved in, that different hospitals are doing different things. Um, and um, uh, with, so for instance, in, in our hospital, we're working directly with a local vaccination centre um, to get our patients prioritised, um, not only with inflammatory bowel disease, but people with rheumatological and dermatological conditions to get them prioritised uh, over the next week or so. So it will vary. Um, I, I don't think people should worry. I think they're going to get a call or a letter uh, inviting them to a vaccine centre or to the GP surgery in the next two weeks. Great. OK. And, it, you know, as you say, it is varying across the country. And certainly for anybody who is, um, keep an eye on our website as well, because we are doing some work around this issue and trying to um, ensure that everybody who needs to be is being identified and contacted and, and getting that um, that dose. So um, I guess one last thing just to mention, the, uh, the BSG guidance, the British Society of Gastroenterology guidance, which as you said, is slightly different to, to what's been published by the government. That is actually now live on the British Society website. So uh, we're post, for everybody who's listening, We'll post something into the chat with that link. Um, but again, because it's slightly different, your, your view is that the, the consultants and the specialists will be taking the BSG line and making sure that um, you know, everybody who needs to be is getting that dose. So Sarah, the, the difficulty with the JCVI guidance is it's actually quite difficult to work out um, whether somebody's eligible working back in time to the first dose of vaccine, which may have been many months ago, to work out whether they were on a certain dose of steroid or, or what have you. So it's very difficult and it's much easier, I think, um, to take a, uh, a less stringent view um, uh, and in, ensure that people are identified and vaccinated. So I think the easier option is the BSG option. Um, and I know that 
uh, the Rheumatology Society, Dermatology Society, and the Renal Society have taken a very similar uh, line as the BSG. Um, I, I'm sure whether the JCVI wanted to wanted that to happen or not, I'm not certain, but um, uh, I, I think it's going to be easier to implement. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tarek. We're, we're right on time um, for ending. And just to reassure again, everybody, we know that there are lots and lots of additional questions and we're going to do our best to signpost you or answer those questions um, after today. But it's been um, fantastic seeing all of the, um, you know, the enthusiasm and the engagement for the talk. And I am now going to um, hand over to Sue to just um, give the thanks to you and um, speak later. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, thanks ever so much, Tariq. That was really excellent. And the, I'm afraid we've only really um, touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of how many questions we've had, but uh, we knew it would stimulate a lot of interest. But I'm sure it's uh, been a very reassuring um, uh, talk for everybody. But thank you again for giving up your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Um, well, everyone, we're going to move on now to our AGM. Um, the former format of that is um, I'm going to lead on a review of last year. Um, I'll be followed by Tom Reddy, our treasurer, who's going to look briefly at our financials. Um, there'll be opportunity to ask us some questions there. So again, if you've got any questions, put them through your Q&A um, area. Um, and then we move on to the exciting bit, the resolution. Um, and for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to vote, you'll be able to do that. Um, and we will, um, the meeting will be brought to a close by Sarah, who's going to uh, give us um, a presentation of our strategy and reviewing where we are. So, Andrew, if you could put up my uh, first slide, please. Here we go. So, yes, welcome to our AGM. Next slide, Andrew, please. We're just going to pause on this one and have a moment. Uh, 2020 as a year, none of us will ever forget. And I think that's the understatement of the century. Um, I think everybody, whether you're five, 95, has a lens and a story to tell of what 2020 was like. I've always been proud um, to be your chairman. And in 2020, looking back on it, it was an absolute privilege to lead such a committed, devoted, hardworking team of people who did all they could to support anybody affected by Crohn's and colitis. I would like to thank Sarah Sleet for her unfailing leadership to respond to ever-changing situation. I know she'll hate this, and that was despite her having a really nasty uh, dose of COVID when we, in the early days, I think it was in March it hit her before we knew much about it, but she kept going. She was supported by her leadership team and our staff, um, and also by, uh, we had the support of our board, who many of them, well, they all have um, big jobs themselves, but at very short notice would give her their time to make sure we were there to make the decisions we needed to. And underp underpinning it all was you, with your constant support. So I'd like to thank each and every one of you uh, for being there for Crohn's and Colitis when we needed you most. We really lived our values. We were ambitious. We all did the best we could. We were compassionate. We focused all our efforts on supporting those who needed us. And we absolutely were stronger together because everyone played their part, whatever was asked of them. I adopted the mantra that we should prepare for the worst and hope for the best, uh, because it was absolutely clear that our income was going to be hit, and it was, and Tom will talk to that uh, after I've spoken. So I'm now going to share what we did, and very much our focus was to support anyone affected by Crohn's and colitis, to weather the storm of COVID. And that's very much what we're about today. Andrew, next slide, please. So here, what did we do? 
we very rapidly had to redirect our resources um, to keep up to date with the fast changing situation and provide you with easy to understand information where we could. We saw an exponential rise in the calls for information from us. As you'll see here, 16,000 queries by phone, email and live chat. In March and April alone, it was phenomenal, the increase of email, 644% and 121% increase in calls. Our Facebook live events with nurses and medics attracted nearly 300,000 viewers. Our COVID-19 hub on the website had 1.8 million page views. So we obviously had to redirect the resources we had to meet that need. Next slide, Andrew, please. So we focused on supporting you in those dark days of lockdown, when, as Tarek said, we were under house arrest. Local networks switched to online socials. Our online community mushroomed. Our forum grew by 20%. And our famous supporters came up trumps and held, on, held online events for us. Thank you to Sasha Darwin and Chris Tarrant. Andrew. And beyond our direct support, we kept up the profile on not every disability is visible um, by keeping open as many accessible toilets as we could influence, as so many were shut. Um, we finished eight research, research grants covering a wide range of topics. We won awards for our app, In My Shoes, for our Nedvid campaign, and for our It Takes Guts film. We were delighted to see the IBD standards of care cross the finishing line, and which is to date the most comprehensive analysis of quality of care um, of IBD services in the UK. Andrew? Yes, we quite simply could not have done it without you. And here we have just a, a number of you uh, kindly um, let us use your slides. Some of you will recognize bottom left, Amy Dowden, fundraisers, members of our online community, people whose stories were told for virtual awareness. Next, Andrew. A researcher, Bernie Carter, campaigners and local network volunteers, IBD nurses, MP in the middle, um, Daisy Cooper. And finally, our online community who shared their stories raising awareness. Yeah, we quite simply couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. Tom, over to you to talk about our finances. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Reddy. I'm the um, Vice Chair and the Treasurer at Crohn's and Colitis. Um, and my job today is to present the 2020 accounts. Um, my opening slide, I've deliberately put up the same quote as Sue. Um, because from a financial perspective, we definitely won't uh, forget 2020 either. Um, so if we can get to business, Andrew, if we can go to the next slide, please. So this shows the, um, the really high level summary. Um, in 2020, we saw a 1.6 million reduction in income um, as the COVID pandemic hit. Um, we also made some significant cuts to our cost base so that we moved from a £700,000 deficit to a £600,000 surplus. And I'll show you in a minute how this has been achieved. Uh, Andrew, next slide, please. Um, before I do that, though, I wanted to show a little bit of context because, um, you know, not just the sort of historic context, but but what we expected. So our budget at the start of the year was um, for both income and for expenditure to be 7.4 million. Um, in other words, we wanted to have sort of no surplus. Um, but it became apparent very quickly in March that that wasn't going to be possible. So we did a reforecast. Um, our reforecast said that we would get 4.1 million of, um, of income and 4.6 million um, of expenditure, which would leave us with a, a further deficit of half a million. Um, but it's also worth saying, actually, our worst case income projection at that point was below three million. So we were obviously very worried about what that meant. Um, in the event, um, as I said a minute ago, we got uh, 4.7 million pounds worth of income, 4 million pounds worth of costs. And we made a, a surplus 
Um, so, you know, actually the final figures were much better than we forecast, and I think represent a, a huge achievement. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So I'll, I'll talk now about a little bit of detail. We'll start with income, um, which was 4.7 million. Um, obviously, there was a massive challenge to income, and I, and I think we did it uh, sort of tremendously well, um, which I think reflects two things. First of all, the really hard work from our income generation team under Claire, um, but actually, you know, even more so the generosity of our supporter base uh, and our local networks. Um, in both cases, we saw a huge amount of adaption um, to COVID. So as a charity, we've done very well to diversify our income streams to new things such as virtual fundraising initiatives. Um, I'd also point to the emergency appeals which are embraced and really well supported by our community. Um, and we got a lot of support from, um, uh, from sort of companies, uh, pharmaceutical uh, in particular. Um, just in terms of the actual movements, I mean, the fall in income was really driven by fundraising. Um, which fell from 3.4 million in, two, in 2019 to 1.8 million in 2020, with a cancellation of nearly all of our physical events, such as walk it, marathons, and, and runs and the like. Um, we also had a bit of a drop off in legacy income, which was less than half the previous year, um, caused by delays in probate uh, and, and few property sales. Um, and some of our other, other income streams. Um, other than that, generally held steady, such as uh, mem uh, membership income. If I then turn to expenditure, um, so this was uh, 4.1 million, which was down 3 million. And, and the big challenge when it comes to our costs is where to cut. So ideally, we want to cut our overhead with as small as an impact as we can on the provision of services and actions that directly deliver on the charity's objects um, and really what our supporters want. Um, we can't avoid the fact we had to make some really tough choices. Um, ultimately, you know, as, as Sue showed a minute ago, we focused on our core essential services, including some of the areas of work where demand had really increased, such as helplines, um, and elsewhere we paused or, or stopped activities. So to summarise, again, some of the key things, um, our staff headcount fell from 78 to 70, um, with associated staff costs falling by about 300,000. Um, we had 25 staff furloughed during the year and the remaining staff um, all had their working hours reduced by 20% from April to October so it was a you know, huge impact on our staff um, and, and you know I think from my perspective hugely appreciate um, you know a, a, actually the commitment that they continue to show despite the fact that it wasn't easy for them personally either. Um, cost of generating funds fell by 600,000 um, largely due to events being cancelled and staff furloughed um, and research was put on hold for a time with a cost in the year falling by 1.2 million. Uh, so, Andrew, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, the net effect of this performance was an unexpected 600,000 um, pounds surplus from our income and expenditure um, for the year. Um, the left hand side of this slide shows the real liquid buffer that we have in terms of cash and investment. Um, Unsurprisingly, you can't see it here, but we saw something of a dip in the middle of the year. Um, but by the end of the year, this had been recovered. Uh, and overall, the level of cash investments remained flat. Um, from the perspective of our formal reserves, um, which you see in our balance sheet, the surplus um, directly you know, benefited them. Um, and it was split between unrestricted reserves, which increased by 400,000, and restricted, which increased by 200,000. Um, so to summarise, I mean, if you'd asked me in March what the outcome for the year would be, I'd have said that firstly, it's incredibly difficult to know. And secondly, actually, we're facing into a real position of, of risk, um, you know, driven by that huge impact that we thought we were going to get to income. And, it, and in that context, you know, I'm incredibly proud of the way that we've responded, both the charity itself and our supporter base to whom, you know, I and I, I know the rest of the trustees are enormously grateful. Um, we've shown ourselves to be adaptable and resilient, and we've come out of this confident that we're well placed for the future with renewed determination to continue the fight um, for the need of all those affected by Crohn's and colitis. That's it from me. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I think we're going to have some questions, weren't we? But I guess I'd also say that Sarah is going to come on to talk shortly about, uh, about the future. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I think that was... Um... I, I would add my voice to Tom's to say, despite the challenges of last year, the board really believe and see we are in a stronger position. 
than we were going into this. And we've really focused and really delivered our, all our efforts. And we really have a firm foundation on which we're re going to rebuild and grow and go forward in a very positive fashion. But thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Sarah? So we only have a couple of questions um, on the presentation so far. Um, and I'm not sure whether you'll be able to answer some of the detail on this, but let me um, give you a go and you can pass back to me if you want. Um, so the first one was wondering about the plans on fundraising, because obviously a lot had to stop with the removal of the face-to-face -face events. Um, so um, plans going forward. I think, as Tom said, what we're seeing under Claire's leadership is that we are diversifying our activities. Um, we were, when I joined the charity, very events driven. And obviously in the COVID world, that was alarming because a lot of them had to stop. Um, and that, as, as Tom's slide showed, we've really diversified and we're going to continue to do that, which actually makes our income much more secure. Um, and actually yesterday at our board meeting, uh, Claire presented a completely new initiative, uh, which I'm not sure I'm allowed to, I, I mean, I, can I say something, oh, I'll just broadly say where, no, I can't give you too much detail, but it's another, it's, an, um, it's a new area for us to raise funds. So we're constantly we're looking at diversification of our fundraising portfolio. So that again, gives us confidence about the foundation for the future. Sarah, do you want to add anything else? Absolutely right. It's all about diversifying where our income has um, is coming from. And, uh, you know, in line with many other charities, we are going to restart our face to face, but we're going to do it very much with um, all the lessons learned about doing some, um, you know, online versions of things. And um, the war kits this year were incredibly successful where people chose how to do their war kit, not necessarily getting together. So there's lots of positives that have come out of our learnings after uh, last year that we're going to implement. So another question, um, are there plans to rehire any staff let go as a result of recent proportionary reductions in staffing levels? And what are the overall plans for increasing staffing levels? Well, I think um, that's an operational question. And Sarah, I'm going to hand it right back to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so as you um, might expect, as we are moving out of the crisis period, we are able to grow again. And um, having staff is really important to our ability to deliver activities. What we're going to be doing is, um, we, we, as I will set out a little bit later, we're slightly changing our focus and our approach going forward. And we have put a new set of roles into the plans for the coming years. And we will be advertising those roles openly because we want to get the best possible people into delivering um, for those roles. Uh, and of course, um, you know, if, if it's appropriate, uh, staff who have um, unfortunately had to leave the charity last year, if they're you know, great for that role, we would be delighted to see them back. I am really reassured though that many of those staff have, we know and we keep in touch with and have already um, got other roles that are, are great roles for them. So um, that's, I hope I have answered that one. And I've just got one left now. Um, which is, um, if there was such an increase in calls to the helpline, why has it been closed down? So I think there's a slight confusion of the types of helplines that we have. So Sue, do you want me to answer that one or would you like to go for that yourself? I think you've got, you've got the details, Sarah. It came to the board and yes, I mean, yeah. I think the evidence speaks for itself, which Sarah will have that at her fingertips. So um, some of you may not be aware, we, there are actually, or there were several helplines uh, for the charity. Um, some of them very focused on particular issues. Uh, our main helpline, which is staffed, um, that is the helpline that we, uh, Sue had in her presentation that had that massive increase in numbers of calls. The other helplines um, are, well, were staffed by volunteers and they were looking at very specific issues. And unfortunately, in those particular cases, 
the demand for the service was going down very, very significantly, actually over a number of years. So we've um, taken the decision that at, in terms of best use of resource and meeting the demand that is out there, we needed to concentrate on our main helpline, which is the one that was delivering those 16,000 um, calls and responses to emails. Um, and that's the one we're going to concentrate on going forward. And there are a number of questions that have suddenly popped up as well now. So um, in this time of uncertainty, how have we done with the objective of funding IBD nurses and efforts to bringing more on board? Well, I think we're very proud of our initiative here um, and it is, continues to be part of our operational um, plan to move that forward. Um, Sarah, have you got the numbers in, to hand? Or? I don't have the numbers to hand, but what I can say is that during, the, um, during 2020, we worked um, a lot with our existing nurses who were um, being funded to take either MSCs or, or additional um, qualifications by the charity. And that partnership was incredibly useful in both making sure that we had the correct information and resources in the charity to deliver information to you guys, but equally um, we were helping to take a bit of a load off of those nurses who were obviously being diverted into um, other activities. And we are going to continue working hard with nurses, making the case for more nurses in the NHS um, focused on IBD, but also enabling those nurses to, to deliver in their own individual service. So it's definitely something we will be taking forward. Um, and then there's one last question here. Um, are there any ongoing or planned studies into cognitive ability um, and issues for people with Crohn's and colitis? And um, Perhaps if I can, can answer that one as well, So just to say that we are going to be continuing to invest very much in research um, and we are looking at different aspects of research and perhaps aspects that are not being addressed necessarily in research agendas. So that is something that certainly we can uh, pick up and have a look to see um, going forward, whether that's a, an area of priority or not for the charity. Um, and then, ah, oh, that's, that's a question, sorry, um, that's a question that's just come up really from Tarek's uh, um, talk, not particularly for the AGM, so I think we have answered all of the AGM questions. Okay, well thank you all very much indeed uh, for listening to that. Uh, we're now going to move on to our resolution. Um, members have already had the chance to register their vote for the meeting and several hundred have done so. Uh, for those of you choosing to vote at the meeting, we're going to um, launch uh, the poll on screen shortly. And there are three options, to agree, disagree or abstain. The resolution we're voting on is that the registered name of the company be changed from Crohn's and Colitis UK to Crohn's and Ampersand Colitis UK with Companies House, the Charity Commission, the Office for the Sc of Scottish Charity Regulator. If you've already voted before the meeting or you're not a member of the charity, please don't use the poll. When the poll closes, we will add the votes to the ones we've already been cast and we'll give you the results. This may take a co couple of moments and now I'll read out the results. Right, uh, can we open up the poll please? Here you go. So you can see the resolution there and um, you can pick your, what you want to do. And place your vote, that'd be great, thank you. Just bear with us for a few moments. How's it going, Sarah? I think you're on mute. <laughs> oh, the world we live in, I'm on mute and I'm off now. So um, I believe the numbers are coming in. Oh, good. So it's working. It seems to be working. Good. 
and we will get the results fairly shortly. I, um, I'm just looking on my phone to make sure that we are um, going to get those. And Nicole appears to be typing, who is the master on this. Nicole. Hi everyone, sorry, um, we've had 44% uh, uh, of participants who uh, completed the poll so far, so a little, little way to go for everyone to complete. Wow, okay, thank you. Sarah, I wonder if it's worth you doing your presentation and then we can do the results at the end if we're only at 44% or is it, are they rolling in, Nicole? Uh, I, I think that's best. Uh, we're at 50% now, so it, um, it might be worth giving people yeah. some time. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Keep so, right, what we're going to do, keep on voting, please. I think it may be the system just churning through. Um, but I'm now going to hand over to Sarah, who is going to talk to you more about the future. Sarah, over to you. And you have the opportunity for questions at the end. And then I will, um, I'll tell you about the results. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. And um, thank you, everyone, for, for sticking with us to the end here. So um, I'm going to pick up on going forward for the charity. Now that you have heard about how we did in 2020, we weathered the storm. Um, and we're in a really good place going forward um, for concentrating on getting change for you for the better. So I'm going to do that Chris Whitty thing and keep asking Andrew to move the slides on. Um, so, Andrew, here we go. First slide. Um, our current strategy actually was um, put together in 2017 and it was um, uh, due to end in 2022. But with what happened in 2020, we really had to think about, has the world changed? Do we need to adjust that strategy? And we went back to review, and that's what we've been doing over the last few months. And in that original strategy, there were some really key aims for us, which were developed with a lot of consultation, a lot of discussion with our community, to identify those issues which you feel are most important to you. And they're up on screen now. And we feel those are still highly relevant aims for the charity going forward. And we're not going to change those. Um, it's been shown, I think, really significantly over the last year how important it is that we really do more work in getting people to understand the impact of Crohn's and colitis and what that means when you are living with a long-term condition, which can have a really significant impact on your life. And too often people just aren't aware of the implications of that. And it's, it's really our job to keep shouting about that and to make sure that people understand the impact. And of course, we need to do more as, um, you know, in terms of research, as you've heard from Tarek, what a difference research can make to lives. And of course, we need to continue to support and empower people as we have been doing over the last year, that getting out of information, the community, it really did make a difference. And in all of that, we need to continue um, with getting better clinical care particularly going forward when things are going to be really, really pressurized in that NHS. So we're gonna stick with the same aims, but the way that we're gonna do it is going to slightly change. So next slide, please, Andrew. Um, just reflecting, first of all, on one of the big figures that has come out in the last 12 months or so. It used to be commonly accepted that there were about 300,000 people in the UK with Crohn's and colitis. But what we really know now through research commissioned by the charity is that in the UK, there are over 500,000 people with Crohn's and colitis. And we know that um, people up and down the land from all walks of life, all backgrounds, 
um, really have got the condition and we need to tell their story in a much uh, more nuanced way and to understand the impact of those lives led. So what we need to do is to think about how we can tell those stories better, how we can understand those stories and communicate individual needs in a much richer fashion than we're currently doing. So in terms of what the charity can do about that, we know at our core, one of the things that the charity is, you know, is really focused on is you. That's our core being. That's what we're about. And there is nobody else that is really doing that. Um, Crohn's and colitis might be part of a healthcare professional's job, but it might not be the whole of the job. It might be part of a policy makers remit, but it won't be the whole of their remit. Crohn's and colitis is the whole of our remit. And that's why we are in the best position to bring together all of that understanding and knowledge and really make the case for you to get change. So um, what we need to do as a charity is to become even better in terms of being experts on your lived experience so that we can get change for you wherever you are, wherever you work, wherever you get educated, wherever you get your health services. How are we gonna do that? Well, just at a very top level, in the next three years, we're gonna focus on three things. So Andrew, next slide please. The first thing we really need to do is to build the evidence base even more. Again, there are bits of the picture um, in research papers, in surveys, in studies, and the charity has been really good at trying to build that evidence base in recent years, particularly through the IBD standards of care. And I don't know how many of you on listening now joined in on answering the patient survey there, but that was really important work because it allowed us to take evidence to policymakers and say, this is actually what's happening on the ground we know this and we need to change it. Unfortunately, we haven't got enough of that. We need to do much more to understand the diversity of experience, the range of experience, and we need to get that evidence base to push change. So it, we're gonna put a lot of investment into building a better evidence base, understanding what we know, what we don't know, and where are the gaps and where do we need to prioritize getting evidence to support change. Andrew, next slide, please. And with that understanding, we're really going to try and raise the game in terms of public awareness. More evidence, more stories, more things to go out to talk to the public about, to, to get those media stories that we all want to see, um, to get the attention in terms of um, policy makers to get the attention in terms of people who are delivering um, in education or the workplace. So we want to raise public awareness. We want to specifically make sure that diagnosis is properly addressed. One of the things that was very apparent in the IBD standards of care work was that diagnosis is a big issue still. We know that um, over a quarter of people took longer than a year to get diagnosed. And with increasing length of diagnosis, there were more and more A&E visits. That's not good for the health service, and that's certainly not good for the patient. And we need to make sure that it's not just secondary care in the hospitals that are doing better. It's also um, in primary care. We know there's a problem in some GP surgeries with recognising quickly Crohn's and colitis, and we need to do much more about that. But we need the evidence to make that change, to make people focus on it. And that was really um, evident in a meeting we held just this week with NHS England, talking to very senior leaders there about the need to make change. And they're very... Um, willing to listen and they're on board with it, but they want to see the facts and figures in order that they invest in that area. And that's where we're going to do more. And of course, we need to understand outside of healthcare where the, act, um, the impact on your lives are and where we can make changes um, 
there as well. Next slide, Andrew. And the charity has built up a, over the years a, a great reputation for providing support for you. And we have um, got enormous amounts of information in the, um, on our website and in publications. And uh, I sometimes describe it a bit like going into an enormous library, row upon row of shelves of books and being told that's, uh, we've got everything here. We've got loads of knowledge about IBD and just being told you go and find out what you need by having a look around. It's not overly helpful. We know we need to be much more targeted and help you find much more quickly the information that is relevant to you. So we're going to do more um, around that. We're going to build a, a, a better website. Um, we're going to build better tools for getting information out to you. We also know that in the NHS, there is a increasing understanding that patient education is really important and needs to be um, delivered in order to keep some of the pressure, if nothing else, off of the NHS staff. That's an area where we think the charity can really help in providing, um, building and providing patient-led um, patient education that can be adopted by the NHS. And that's something that we will um, do going forward. And of course, we're also, um, it really um, need that peer support, the community, was so important to so many people, particularly in the last 18 months. And we're going to um, continue that building peer support, um, working with our fantastic uh, local networks and um, building online communities. So there will continue to be work there. Next slide, Andrew, please. But we can only do it with you. And here are these um, fantastic supporters again, whether you're a, a volunteer, whether you're a fundraiser, whether you're a supporter, a donor, whether you're a celebrity, uh, whether you're a politician, healthcare professional, we can do this if we do it together and we can make a real difference and change lives if we work together. So that in the headline is uh, our strategic direction of travel. You're gonna hear much more about it over the next few weeks and months and the specific work that we want to do for you. So thank you. And I'm going to pass over to questions. which hopefully Claire is going to appear. Here is Claire. Thank you very much. We've just got a few and um, a bit more are coming in as I speak. So um, we'll start with the first one, which is about um, the a jump in the numbers of people diagnosed from 350, it was before 350,000 to 500,000. Um, and uh, are we already engaged with government departments about this to ensure that they're aware that this means more priorities needed in these areas? Absolutely. And um, we have really made the point to, to government, to policymakers, NHS leaders, that um, planning assumptions within the NHS are largely still based on this 300, 350,000 figure. And when you have 500,000 plus, that's a big difference. Um, and we are really um, supported in that by healthcare professionals who uh, whenever they produce reports now to government are also using this figure to make the point. So I think it's a big difference um, and it will make a big difference in planning terms as well. Thank you. Um, we have a comment about the IBD nurses and um, somebody's thanking us for our diligence and attention in that regard. Just wondered if you had any other thoughts about the nurses or anything else you wanted to share about the nurse programme which is going forward. Yeah, so as I said earlier, the, the nurses are, we know are a critical component in terms of really good quality care. And our IBD standards report showed that um, good nurses um, and availability of nurses made a difference to people's experience of care. So we have been working hard with uh, nurses to find out what they individually want in terms of support. And one of the areas, for example, that we realized um, actually the charity has expertise in which would help them is in telephone advice lines. So we've been running um, very practical courses to help those nurses deal with telephone advice lines. Um, clearly they have the clinical expertise, 
that actually many of them have never been trained in how to deliver that information over a telephone advice line. So we've been supporting with practical things there. We're also looking at how we can support with their um, career development. Um, so we have uh, looked at how we can support them move on to the next stage in terms of their um, professional development. And of course, we continue to work very hard in making the case and helping individual services to make the case for more nurses where they're needed. Thank you. Um, a question really about an observation um, and uh, if you have any more information about it really. So the perception is that surgery seems to be more common than it was previously. Um, is that correct? No, I don't believe it is correct, actually. Um, I think particularly for colitis, uh, surgery rates have been going down, which is a good news story. Um, and we can, I'm sure we can post up some information and reply to that afterwards with the exact figures because I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, but that said, we know surgery is a, is a big issue for people with Crohn's and colitis. And one of the things that we have um, been trying to get uh, um, evidence on is what is the impact of the COVID crisis on access to surgery and um, again this just this week we've been making the case that actually people who um, are you know sort of in need of surgery um, in the elective terms aren't necessarily getting it their operations are being cancelled and they are getting into a position where they're having to go in as an emergency that is not good news for the NHS and it clearly isn't for the patient who may not be as well as they could have been going into surgery. So um, it's a really important issue that we are um, pressing very hard on. Thank you, that was the end of the question. So unless I get some more in, um, I think that is finished. Thank you ever so much for your questions, everybody. Oh, uh, last question just flew in. Uh, is there a simple way that somebody can get involved in fundraising? Oh, Claire, surely that's one oh, for you. Yes, uh, yes there is. Um, we will share a link to our fundraising pages on our website, but uh, we have lots of options, including something coming up at Christmas, um, which might um, be of interest to people. So um, it will be launched in the Connect magazine, which will be with you in October. So have a look in there, but also will be on our website after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Claire. Um, I'm delighted I can move on to the result of our poll. I'm delighted to announce the resolution has been unanimous, well, not you quite unanimously, but um, has got through uh, with 88% of the votes for. Um, so that's 826 people voted for it. Um, only 5%, 47 people against, and 69 people, 7% abstained. So uh, we are going to be able to change our name and represent the brand uh, with all those agencies we need to do that. So um, thank you. It just reminds me to thank everybody once again. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, thank particularly to Tariq uh, Ahmed for his amazing um, and very informative talk. Um, and we hope you found it useful. Um, yeah, and we'll keep you in touch on our various um, in our various platforms and ways. So yeah, please keep our, keep your ear to the ground. We'll keep you updated. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.